Hey folks, this is a man once again, and a couple things, of course. A year ago, I did talk about this pay-per-view event, but I figure if I'm doing a series of videos, it just keeps with the continuity. And uh, I know I'm not in my DVD room. Well, I want to do a couple stuff from in here. I still love the background with these posters. I love these posters, so I'll still do some stuff here, but I'll go back and forth. And maybe this one won't be so long, again, because I talked about Survivor Series 1987 like a year ago. Because I'm like, oh, I'm getting back into wrestling, the older stuff. And just, I talked about like a couple of them, but I'll put the link down below to that. But I figured, again, for continuity, the last thing I talked about was, was it WrestleMania 4? Or, no, WrestleMania 3, not 4. WrestleMania 3, because that was 87. And one thing I want to point out is I really enjoy the commentary of Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura together. I know on the first WrestleMania I had some little bit of issues with just some of the lingo that uh, Gorilla Monsoon said. Like, just weird. Like, Pearl Harbor jobs, stuff like that. But... I gotta say, watching a lot of these pay-per-views, they do work very well together. Gorilla Monsoon and Jason Ventura, I think they're a good team. Um, of course, the best is Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby the Brain Heenan, which we haven't got to them yet, pay-per-view style. But, again, Gorilla Monsoon and Jason Ventura, they work very well together. I think it's a good... Good commentary, bad commentary, and bad as in the heel. Just Ventura is the heel commentator to put down the heroes and up the villains. And Grill Monsoon is the good guy, and he was a former wrestler. And really enjoy these two together, especially later on when Vince McMahon gets into it. And Vince McMahon is not that good of a commentator. He's like, "What a maneuver!" He doesn't know what the fuck a wrestling move is. What a maneuver! But Grill Monsoon does because again, he was a wrestler. So, I, I know I've said this four times before, but for the last time, uh, Grill Monsoon and Jason Ventura really enjoy the, those two together. It's uh, fun to listen to those two when they do these commentaries. Definitely a lot better than anything today. But Survivor Series 1987, of course, is the first Survivor Series. WrestleMania 3 was so huge, so big that they got, they went, hey, we gotta have more pay per views. And Jesse Ventura is the heel commentator bitching about, oh, well, Andre won, he was cheated, he got the three count. Because that thing in WrestleMania 3, the match where Hogan tried to body slam, Andre fell on Hogan, and then won two. Oh, did he get the three count? And Jesse's saying, oh, some people say that Andre really won. And person matches here. Let me get the F. Yeah, the Machos versus the Haunties. <laughs> as how I would put it. Macho Man Randy Savage, which by this time became a good guy. Because the Haunty Tom Man grabbed him and smashed him in the head. With a guitar, among other stuff. I think he actually saved his woman, Miss Elizabeth, as well, so that helped him be a good guy. Jake the Snake Roberts, Ricky Steamboat, who he was the Intercontinental Champion. He won at WrestleMania 3, but as I said before, he wanted some time off because his wife was giving birth to his son. And this man got pissed off. Like, hey, you were just you just became the Intercontinental Champion. You already won time off. So thus he lost it pretty soon after to the Haunty Tonk Man, who I never care for as a wrestler. Even even supposed to be a bad guy, I just never care for the Haunty Tonk Man. But so Haunty Tonk Man at the time became the longest running Intercontinental Champion up until Believe it was SummerSlam, which I'll get to that because it's one of my favorite parts of that SummerSlam.
88. Where the ultimate warrior kept the shit out of him for like 30 seconds in one. A because I like the ultimate warrior and B because I don't like Honky Top Man so that was great. But at this point he was a big villain. But yeah, S Savage, Jake the Snake, Ricky Steamboat, Brutus the Barber, Beefcake, who I begin to like. The crowd really enjoys him. And he has a fun personality and decent enough wrestler. I'm starting to warm up to Brutus the Barber Beef K. I like quite a few of his matches. And Hatsaw Jim Duddian, who I don't mind. He's more of a brawler type. I don't mind him, though. <clears throat> but they fought against the Haunty Tom Man, Hercules, Dangerous Danny Davis, who is a referee that turned bad. Ron Bass and Harley Race. <coughs> a lame part of it is Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Harley Race had a double count out because they were fighting outside. But uh, Beef Kate gives a high knee to Ron Bass and takes him out. But Haunty Tom Man takes out Beef Kate. A fun moment is Jake the State doing a DDT on that bad ref, Dangerous Danny Davis, which the crowd, huge, huge reaction from the crowd. Like a lot of these parts, you see that Jake the State was huge. And he could have been a contender, like a big superstar contender. And I don't have the time if it was Judge that fucked him up or something else that fucked him up or they just wouldn't let him run with it I have no idea <clears throat> but he the crowd was huge and when he gave that DDT on the that Danny Davis the reaction was humongous and fun stuff with him some guy has him in a choke where he gives a chin breaker lands down so the guy hits his chin on uh, Jake the State's head uh, Macho Man gives a flying elbow to Hercules. So now Ron Bass, Danny Davis, Hercules are out. And then, of course, Harley Race, he uh, was counted out with Jim Duggan. And then Haunty Taunt Man runs away. I guess because he's going to fight another day and they don't want to take him out too soon. But that was my favorite match of the night because I love Macho Man Randy Savage, Jake the Snake Roberts, and Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat didn't get to do too much. He'd have to do a couple moves, but not too much. But uh, those were the three survivors, and I just enjoy those three guys. I mean, just having those three guys on the same team was cool enough. That It was just an entertaining match. And then after an entertaining match, you get the women's five on five. The fabulous Mula, who I never cared for. I guess she was a good guy, good girl, because she was on the side of the other heroes, like Rocky Robin, who I think is a half sister to Jade the Snake Roberts or something like that. Velvet McIntyre and the Jumpin' Bomb Angels versus Sensational Sherry, the Glamour Girls, Donna Cristianello, and Don Marie, who were villains. I mean, even one of them was with Jimmy Hart. So, but it was like, why is Fabulous Moolah on the hero team? Was she? I never knew she was a quote good guy. And I'll tell you one thing: the crowd is fucking dead in this match. Because most of these women wrestlers couldn't wrestle. The only ones that could wrestle were the ones from Japan. The Jumpy Bomb Angels. Itsuki Yamazaki and Norio Tatino. Probably said that name wrong. Who would also be in, I think it was Royal Rumble. And they were good. Like, they knew how to wrestle. And I don't know what happened to them because they were in two pay-per-views in a row. This one and Royal Rumble 1988. And the crowd got into it when they were in it. Because I think the crowd realized, hey, these these two women from Japan, they can wrestle. 
They didn't actually go. They didn't actually do some stuff. And they didn't do some cool stuff. Especially in an era that, to be honest, the women wrestling weren't really that much of anything. And honestly, again, like when it was and even when Fabulous Bulu was on there, even though she was on the good team, people booed her. No one liked her. And she couldn't wrestle. And I don't know why she was in there. She just couldn't do anything. Sherry was okay, but... Eh. Again, the only people who could wrestle was the Jumping Bomb Angels, which they were the survivors, which was a good choice. The third match... I don't know why they did this. They did this isn't the first. I mean, obviously this is the first time because it's the first Survivor Series, but it would not be the only time where they did this, where it was a twenty-man match. It was ten versus ten, because it was tag team Survivor Series elimination match, where here's five tag teams versus another five tag teams. That team. Would a deep breath does name all these fucking names. Strike Force, Tito Santana, Rick Martel this is before he becomes the Rick the Model Martel. The Young Stallions, Paul Roman, Jim Powers. The Fabulous Rujos, Jack and Raymond. The Killer Bees, Jim Brunzel and B. Brian Blair. And the British Bulldogs, David Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid. Defeats, The Hart Foundation, Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart. The Islanders, Haku and Tama. Demolition, Axe and Smash. The Bolsheviks, Nikolai Volkov and Borzukov. And the Dream Team, Great Valentine and Dino Bravo. <laughs> and the only survivors were the Young Stallions and the Killer Bees, which I'm like, yeah, the two tad teams that really no one cared about and went on to do nothing. I mean, think about the Hart Foundation did, and British Bulldogs people remember more. Than the killer bees and the fucking yun stallions. But those were. The, and that was the longest one. It was at least. The match itself, 37 minutes long, but you had stuff before, you had stuff after it. That's the thing. You can't have. And it, they would do this again. Because first off, there's so many fucking people, they surround the entire ring. So then you, it's almost like you have to look over to see who the hell's in the ring. And. It just goes on for so long because you have so many people. You have so many people. I mean, of course, it's going to be the longest match. You just have so many damn people involved, and everyone's got to get their turn in. This person's got to get in the fight, and this person's got to get in the fight, and it's just. I'm like, that's a bad idea. And then they would do it again. I just. Just so many stuff to keep track of as well. Uh, Tio Santana pin Bor Zukov, pinfall after a flying forearm. Uh, Axe pin one of the Rujos after the Rujo brother missed a diving crossbody. Um, this is really stupid. Smash the demolition again disqualified because uh, for hitting a referee. Tio Santana got beat. Pinfall after Hart broke up a pinfall attempt. Haku pins the Dynamite Kid after a Savak kit, Kick. Uh, Paul Roma pinned Great Valentine after a diving sunset flip. Bret Hart was pinned by Jim Brunzel after Tama knocked over Brunzel who had Hart in his arms and rolled through to a pin. And then finally, Tama, one of the Islanders, was pinned by one of the Killer Bees. Because the Killer Bees, they had this thing where they put on a mask, both of them, and then they could switch out behind the referee's back. So the, the fresh person would go in, do this sunset flip, and pin the guy. So the Killer Bees and Young Stallings win. And I'm like, again, two tag teams that I don't care about. I don't give a shit about. 
A fun segment was sort of an introduction to the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, who was always a great villain. I always remember that punch he had where he right to his face and he would fall right down to the ground to hit the guy in the face. So he had like a punch here and fall down. And I always thought that was a really cool way to do a punch to a guy on the ground. But pretty much introducing him and how he spends his Thanksgiving. Uh, he tells a kid to do push-ups and I'll give you money. He's like, oh, you didn't quite make it, did you? Or like a little kid doing a basketball dribbling. If you do it this many times, and when the kid's close, they kick the basketball away from him. Oh, so close. <laughs> Um, they did a guy to kiss his feet. And I know the guy who did that, I think he would later become a wrestler, and I forgot who he was. I forgot who he is, but, uh, but yeah, I completely forgot who he is. I don't even know if it says here on, uh, I don't think it says here on Wikipedia. But, uh, Oh yeah, the first match, the reason Jake the Snake was in there is he was another, I mean, they were, most of them were victims of Haunty Tom Man. Randy Savage got hit, Ricky Stimble lost the championship to Haunty Tom. Jake the Snake, he had this thing called the Snake Pit where he would interview people and the Haunty Tom Man fucked him up royally. And I think there was talk that maybe Jake the Snake would get the Intercontinental Championship, but... That guitar that he used to hit Jake the Snake, apparently they didn't do it right. So when he hit, it kept hitting Jake the Snake. He got hurt royally fucked up from that. I think he actually says on here. Um, just, which is too bad because the guy... Haunty hit a guitar Roberts on an edition of Snake Pit. Uh, it doesn't say. I think it goes more into detail if you go on his page. But yeah, apparently that really fucked up royally. At least for a little while. But the, the Million Dollar Man summon was fun. Promos from the opposing teams. For some reason, when Hulk Hogan's team, Hulk Hogan has his bandana, but he has these stupid tassels that cover his fucking eyes. And I go, why do you have these tassels that are covering your fucking eyes? You can't see anything. It look stupid. But uh, the last match, Under the Giant, one man game, which this is actually the guy who would later become a team. When he joined the big boss man in a tag team. But at this point he was the one man game. Team Tom Bundy, Butch Reed, and Rick Rude. Versus Hulk Hogan, Paul Orndorff, Don Morocco, Ken Patera, and Bam Bam Bigelow. And I think this is the first pay-per-view you see Bam Bam. Which I like Bam Bam Bigelow. I know some people say that he definitely got a lot more to do in ECW or such, but they didn't really use him much here in WWF. And I remember I had a fast beginning, and the crowd was really for Bam Bam when Bam Bam got in. But like Hulk Hogan beat Butch Reed with a leg drop. Uh, but Ken Patera got beat by one man game with a double clothesline. Paul Orndorff, who I was kind of warming up to, got beat by Rick Rude with a roll up after interference from King Kong Bundy. Um, then Rick Rude got beat by Don Morocco after a power slam. Don Morocco got beat by one man game after a 747, 747 splash. Uh, Hulk Hogan. He got counted out because Bundy and One Man Gang fucked with Hogan. One let him back in the ring, so he got counted out. And he made this big scene about it. <clears throat> and this match, I was kind of liking it, except the ending I thought was kind of lame looking back on it. 
because the crowd is really for Bam Bam, Bigelow, because now he's alone against these three big guys, Andre the Giant, Team Tom Bundy, and One Man Gang. And it's like this sort of Bam Bam doing the best that he can, and he pens Team Tom Bundy, he pens One Man Gang, trying to go up against Andre, doing some maneuvers to get away from him. Andre does this lame move. I mean, again, by this point, Andre could barely move, let alone do a move. And I don't mean disrespect, but it's true. Andre couldn't do anything. That's why I think he's a tad overrated. I mean, I love him in The Princess Bride, and, you know, the look is great, but he couldn't do anything. I mean, that's why I at least give the bid show. The bid show could do a lot of stuff. A lot more than, uh, than uh, Andre, but uh, so Bam Bam loses, but it's like, okay, he lost, but you know, he did the best that he could, he made a valiant effort, Andre the Giant's the sole winner, but then Hogan sort of comes in and steals the thunder, steals Bam's thunder that he might have had, because Bam Bam like disappears, and then Hogan comes in to attack Andre, and then he's there posing for like, 10 minutes, and it's like, wow, you just stole Bam Bam Bigelow's, like, this could have been something that really propelled Bam Bam Bigelow into bigger things, but when this is over, people don't remember Bam Bam now, they just remember Hogan coming in to hit Andre and pose for, like, another 5-10 minutes, so that's what I mean by the ending kind of ruined it. It just, again, it's holding, stealing the thunder away from Bam Bam. It's like, wow, he just completed this sort of, he did the best that he could. And at least he could have had holding, like, raise Bam Bam. And both of them raise their hands together or or so forth. Maybe give Bam Bam a last hit on Andre, but no. So the fact that he steals Bam Bam Biggles thunder kind of sucks but you know that's history so uh, the Survivor Series you know I liked my favorite was the first one I mean Randy Savage, Jake the Snake and Ricky Steamball on the same team and the three of them winning is a win for me the women's I liked the job at Bomb Angels I liked watching them the twin man tag team are just such a cluster that it was just too long that I kind of was half in half out Cool to see the seven of the million dollar man. He's just a great bad guy. And the last match, a couple decent stuff. You know, the beginning was good, but I didn't care for the ending. So overall, you know, I liked it. Survivor Series for a first one, I liked it. So showing some of the notes I should jot down. Uh, but again. I think the first time I did this, it was about the same link. So if you want to hear my thoughts on it a year ago, I'll try to remember to put the link down below. But uh, either way, thanks for watching. Take care. And see you on the next one. Later.